church say amen. Amen. Let the church say amen. Amen. Let the church say amen. Amen. Giving glory and honor where glory and honor is due to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is truly the head of my life. All due respects and glory and peace to Pastor Kerry, who is the head of this house and assistant pastor. Pastor Yvonne, thank you, thank you, gratitude for allowing me to come here this evening and share to all clergy. I want you to focus on Mark chapter 15, starting at uh, 33rd, 30, you want to go through the 33rd, 34th verse, amen? Amen. amen. Now, if I stumble a little bit, it's because I need new medicine in my glasses. My wife been getting on my case about it for about a month, and I keep procrastinating. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Now I'm getting this, like this fog. Well, those who wear glasses know what I mean. Amen? Amen. Yeah, I'm not going to take them off. I'm going to try that. I keep trying. I go over there like, man, maybe I can. No, I'm not going to Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Amen. Can we just give God some praise? We're in the house of the Lord, amen? Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad to be here. Yes. There's uh, so many other distractions and places that we could be by uh, not knowing who Jesus is. But because we do know who Christ is, we're in the house of the Lord, amen? amen. I couldn't think of a uh, better place to be. Amen. Amen. Scriptures read, and when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, 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 lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now many know the story. And I'm here just to piggyback on what thousands have preached and ministered before me. The story is being told about Jesus, the one who knew no sin, who is being made sin for us all. A living sacrifice who was forsaken but never forgotten. Jesus cried with a loud voice, why have you forsaken me? How can we, or how can you, how can us, all of us, really know anything about anything if we don't have the experience about something. Jesus had never experienced sin, and now all of a sudden he is about to experience, feel, taste, smell, and see sin. Not as himself committing or doing it or creating sin, but being exposed to sin. This was something that he did not expect the symptoms of divine wrath of God the Father and the abandonment. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt abandoned? Have you ever felt like you were in a place of darkness? Have you ever felt like there was no love in your life? Have you ever felt like there was no peace in your life? Have you ever felt like joy had abandoned you? You couldn't find joy. There was no happiness in your life. Jesus felt like that. For only that moment, he felt abandoned. Jesus felt like, I'm all alone. Why am I all alone? Why, Father, are you forsaking me? Why have you departed from me? Nobody understands you. Nobody understands your pain. Nobody understood Jesus' pain. Tonight, some may have went through loneliness. Some may have went through suffering. Some may have went through some fear, just like Jesus. But understand this. He said in his word that many shall go, we shall go through trials and tribulations. We shall go through certain things in this world because he went through certain things in this world. He bore the sins of the world. He died on the cross. Amen? Amen. For you and for me. Understand that we may feel forsaken, but remember, we're never forgotten. Christ, 
who intercedes for us on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, Unto the Father, forgive, for they know what not what they do. Yes. Amen? Amen. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the NIV translates it like this, says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. It don't matter. Let me repeat this again. It don't matter what you feel like in your life. It don't matter what you think in your life. What only matters is that you understand what Christ went through for you. Amen. Resurrected Sunday. It's right around the corner. And we must always remember each and every day of what Jesus did for us. No matter what we may be going through in our lives, we will never ever go through a, 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 a small portion, a small amount of what Christ did when he was on the cross. What really matters is that we trust in the Lord all the time. Proverbs say we must trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not into our own understanding. But in all our ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. And I put an insert in here, not only will he direct our path, he will correct our path. Not only will he correct our path, but he will protect our path. Remember Christ died. He died for you. He died for me. He took on the sins of the whole world, not just for some people, not for just this particular type of people, not for that particular type of people, but for the whole world. That we should all come up under the umbrella of his love. We should all come up to, unto the Heavenly Father one day to share in his glory, to enter into the throne room. I've said this many a time. I'm not trying to just get to heaven. I want to be in the throne room. Amen? Amen? See, a lot of people think, oh, I accepted Christ in my life, and I can still do this, and I'm going to heaven. Well, let me tell you, there's going to be work to do in heaven. There's going to be positions given in heaven. And I don't want to be on the outside of the gates in heaven. Amen? Amen. If I can use that for a minute, for a, 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 an example, I, I want to be inside. I want to be where Christ is. I want to be where the saints of God are. I want to be where the worship and the praise is. Amen? Amen. <laughs> No matter what we do in this life, always remember that we're going to go through trials. We're going to go through tribulations. We're going to go through some... See, so many times in life we experience, oh, my son died, my daughter died, my husband, my wife, whatever may have, it may have been. And what do we do? Oh, my God, why? Well, understand when you read the scriptures. It's all about understanding who God is. Jesus knew who the Father was. But for that moment... For that very simple moment, he asked the Father, why have you departed from me? Why have you forsaken me? Why did you leave me? He knew about it was coming. It says it in Psalms, I believe the 22nd Psalm, it talks about it. He knew the prophecies, but he didn't have the experience of all the, 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 the passing of the hatred, the, the, the crimes, the... Today, we, we think it's strange because somebody walks into a school and shoot little kids. We think it's strange because people are walking in movie theaters and, and, they're, and they're just shooting people at random. We think it, it's strange that a person can be walking down the street with their child and, 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 and people approach them and rob them and then shoot the child because they didn't get the money that they want. We think it's strange. Jesus said these things are not strange. But at the same time, we forget Although God may be in a position where we think that he has forsaken us, he'll never forget us. He never forgot Christ. He never will forget. His love is continuous. His, his peace is continuous. His joy is everlasting. And all we got to do is call on the Father at any given time. Amen? Amen. Amen. Remember Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what Jesus said because he experienced the cross. He experienced everything and then some. We, All of us together in every church in the world could not match up to what Jesus experienced 
when he cried out to the Father. So I just want to share this with you, church. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling all alone, when you're feeling like nobody cares, when you think God has abandoned you, when you think God has left you, when you think that there's no peace, no joy, no comfort in your life because of circumstances and situations, you can cry out just like Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you can also remember like Jesus. He was never forgotten. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's my word. Amen. 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 Thirsty patient. 
perhaps someone who had had surgery or possibly a stroke, someone who could not lift the cup on their own. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Any of you ever Amen. experienced that before? Oh, ever given yes. someone oh, yeah. water that way? I remember one patient in particular whose broken bones in both his arms and his legs kept him from moving. Can you give me a drink? Thirst is the universal experience that is essential for sustaining all life. John's Gospel likes to point out the many ways that Jesus' humanity is revealed. In John's Gospel, we know that, that Jesus weeps, he gets angry, and he thirsts. But I think here on the cross, when Jesus said, I thirst, rather than revealing his humanity, I think Jesus was revealing his full divinity. God on the cross, the divinity of Jesus exposed there. The love that held God to that cross became the liquid poured out for our sakes. It's the water that is separated at our baptism. It is the water that brings forth new creation. Jesus thirst fulfilled scripture. Scripture that pointed to God's work of salvation from Psalm 69. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Rather than pasta, the liquid that Jesus thirsted for, that is essential for life, is love. And here's the thing. On Good Friday, we acknowledge that the crucified God still thirsts for our love. What makes our love available to God, what quenches God's thirst, is our complete trust, our faith. God thirsts for us to love God with our whole life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Not just sharing just a little sip of ourselves, one sip at a time, but our whole life is what God thirsts for. There on the cross is not the only time that Jesus asked for a drink. Do you remember Jesus in Samaria? Give me a drink. Jesus greets the woman at the well. He was certainly able to get his own drink at that time. And the woman is already suspicious. What did Jesus really want from her? She asks, why are you asking me for a drink? Well, it doesn't take long to realize that the way to care for someone who thirsts is through relationship. The way to care for someone who thirsts is through relationship. Amen? Amen. <laughs> this woman at the well has the longest recorded conversation with Jesus found anywhere in scripture and she accepts the truth that he gives to her. She is so transformed by that conversation. She goes back to the village where she had been outcast and brings many to meet Jesus. She has fallen in love with yet another man. She has fallen in love with Jesus. She has fallen in love with the truth, with the, with the life, and with the way. This question, give me a drink, was the very question I heard when my relationship with Jesus was deepened. Why are you asking me for a drink? What kind of relationship are you calling me to? What Jesus was asking the woman at the well for was this. Give me what I'm thirsting for most. Let go of your past. Let go of your five husbands. Give Amen. me your whole life. Amen. He told the woman, when you drink the water that I shall give, it will become in you a spring welling up to eternal life. 
You see, when God gives us water, when God gives us his love, what Jesus accomplished on that cross, giving us the love that is essential for life, there is none of this sipping out of a hose. God is like a three-year-old pouring water out over us until we are drenched in love, drenched, soaked, and saturated by his love and grace. God is the ultimate fireman. A big, huge hose of water poured out to save our lives. Jesus Christ thirsts for more than our doing good things in the world, more than doing good things for others. Following Jesus means placing our full trust in his grace, placing our full love in his life. Following Jesus means that our lives become those lives that are filled with love. Our one single aim in life is to quench the thirst of Jesus, the thirst of Jesus on that cross, to relieve his suffering, to give him our love and our lives. Your cup and mine. Jesus wants to drink deeply of the love that places our complete and full trust in Him. Amen. 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 Sixth word from John 19, verses 29 and 30. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Gospels of Mark and Matthew tell us that when Jesus uh, breathed his last breath, he let out a loud cry. But they don't tell us what it was that he said. It's the Gospel of John that lets us know that he cried out, It is finished. It is finished. Now there's many different ways to interpret. It is finished. There may have been some people standing in the crowd there who thought Jesus was just making a simple statement. I'm dying, and it's over. He was dying. Humanly, he was dying, like we will all have to die one day. Others in the crowd might have thought that Jesus was saying, My agony is over, and I'm giving up my life now. Jesus was tortured and was suffering like, like no one, no one who hasn't experienced a crucifixion was suffering. It, it could be conceived that, that Jesus was, was looking towards death as a hope, as an end to all of this suffering. suffering. Others in the crowd still may have understood Jesus' words as meaning, it's all over, I tried, and I failed. They heard his cry as the cry of the defeat 
of a disillusioned prophet. But none of these interpretations take into account that, that Jesus knew that he was going to Jerusalem to die. He had told his disciples many times that this is what he was going to Jerusalem to do. His arrest, his torture, his crucifixion was no surprise to him. He had come to Jerusalem for that purpose. His cry, it is finished, was not a cry of defeat or agony. For one thing, Jesus shouted out these words. He had been hanging on the cross. And you know how crucifixion suffocates you. And it causes you to, to lose your breath and eventually you die from suffocation. Just breathing becomes so hard to do. But he cried out. It is finished. He had to lift himself up, push with all of his strength against the nails that were holding his feet to the cross and pull himself up with the nails that were hanging him on the cross beam. And he shouted out, It is finished. Actually, he only said one word. It's a word in Aramaic that John translates into the Greek also as simply one word. Teltelesta means finished, completed, accomplished. It's like Jesus was saying, mission accomplished. Amen. It's like Will Willimon, bishop of the Methodist Church, tells a story that, that he imagines Jesus' words were like Michelangelo. Words when, when he did his last brushstroke on the Sistine Chapel. Completed. Finished. Accomplished. Something astounding. Something amazing. Something awesome was finished as Jesus died on the cross. A masterpiece of love and redemption. But what was it that Jesus accomplished? What was it that he finished and completed? What was it that, that his death did for us? Theologians down through the centuries have uh, tried to explain various theories of atonement, at one man, becoming one with God. But what Jesus has accomplished is so great that no one theologian's theory says it all. Jesus' death on the cross is an amazing, marvelous accomplishment. What he did so profoundly changes our relationship with God. That's right. So profoundly changed the relationship that, 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 that Paul and, and the writers of the Gospels, they can't narrow it down to even one single explanation. You know, there are at least a dozen different ways in the New Testament that, that explain 
what the meaning of Jesus' death is. The Gospel of John reveals at least seven different ideas about the significance of Jesus' death. The first is that Jesus' death is an atoning sacrifice to save us from our sin. Jesus pays the price so that we might be forgiven for the sins that we have committed. Number two, Jesus' death is a substitutionary sacrifice to save us from death. Jesus substituted himself for us. We should have been the ones dying on the cross for our sins. But it was Jesus who substituted himself. Number three, Jesus' crucifixion is a demonstration of God's divine love for all men. God loves us. Unconditionally loves us. And, and the crucifixion shows us the depth of God's love for us. Number four. Jesus is a model for Christians. A model that we're meant to look at to see what sacrificial love really is. It's a model that, that, that we are to see as, as, as if we want to love like Jesus, love like God loves. If we are being called to be followers of a God who is love, then we understand that that love means it will go to the cross for those that they love. Number five, his life, his death, are to be such a compelling portrait that our hearts will be stirred to come to him and to follow him. The picture of who Jesus was, what he taught, how he loved and cared for, for the, the disciples, how he loved and cared for the least, the lost, the lonely, and the left out. Such a compelling picture, again, of this love that would go to the cross for us. Number six, his death, death and resurrection are a sign of God's ultimate defeat of death. He's been raised from the dead now. Amen. God is more powerful than even death. Even death can no longer hold us down. We are promised the resurrection ourselves as well. And number seven, Jesus' death and resurrection are a dramatic reversal of the events in the Garden of Eden that followed the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Sin came into the world because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. But life came into the world because of Christ's obedience Amen. to God. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is our Redeemer, He is our Savior, He is our High Priest, He is our Paschal and Atoning Lamb, He is our Liberator, and He is the King who will die for His people. Through His death, He reveals our sinfulness, the costliness of grace, and the magnitude of God's mercy. On the cross... He shows us what love looks like. In his death and resurrection, he identifies with our pain, with our suffering, with, with our human mortality. And in his resurrection, he proves that he has overcome all of these. 
Jesus was doing all of this on the cross to redeem us, to save us, and to draw us into a relationship with Him. This is what He finished on the cross. Paul summarizes it best for me, his life, his death, his resurrection, and the meaning of the cross when Paul in Romans 1, verse 16 says, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Amen. Amen. Amen.